So, um, I'm Harley Denali Lee. I'm a judge of Wurung person and speaker through my grandfather and through his great grandfather, who was a judge of Wurung person, but also because I was born on judge of Wurung country as well. Um, so, before I start the presentation, I would like to give an acknowledgement to the Wurundjeri people in Judge Wurrung language, um, which is the land that um, um, we're, most of us are currently on. Um, so I'd like to say, I'd like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people and their country the language that they speak is Woiwuru, and that I like to give um, respects to the elders past and present. All right, I'll start the um, presentation. All right. All right, so the book um, is mostly um, about research. Um, I'm gonna do the best I can to um, talk about the book, uh, the main point, points in the first chapter. Um, and um, it's been kind of like a bit of a struggle trying to negotiate what goes in, what, what's there, because it's so it's really interesting stuff and I want everyone to know everything about it. Um, but um, so the book is mostly, yeah, it's focused on research, but also for Indigenous researchers um, um, that the chapter is there to guide them through um, these types of things. But also um, it also applies to any researcher to be aware of um, the types of legacies that researchers have done in the past and that not to try and um, reenact those legacies again. Um, and so there's uh, three additions to the book, and um, to that today we're just going to address the first edition, which is the one on the far left. Um, the one on the far right um, includes um, some more stuff from uh, which um, at the introduction it kind of gives you an idea of what um, indigenous scholars sort of how has her has her work contributed to their work as well. So. If you want to see the third edition, I suggest reading that too, if you've got time in the future. So the outline, the chapter is about research and how it contributes to Western science and Western knowledge. Research is intrinsically linked to colonialism and imperialism. And this is one of the main points of discussion from this chapter. I, will be, I also will be pointing out that this chapter contributes to my own research and developing methodologies. I'm only going to give you like a little bit because I can't talk about everything and we're mostly talking about the chapter, but I just want to sort of reflect on what this chapter sort of has shown me and where has it kind of taken me in, but also where does it show you in the research and um, sort of like what other people are sort of seeing, but also like um, where does this book kind of help you understand that as well type thing. Um, and so the roles in it, um, so also I'll be talking about the roles of Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers as well, but there's so much more um, in the chapter about this, but I'll just talk about what's the main points there. Um, so before I uh, do this, I just want to give a definition of colonialism and imperialism. So I'll also be kind of expanding a bit more from the chapter because the ch that chapter kind of talks about things broadly. Um, I kind of want to scope in a little bit to get an understanding for some of you here who may not understand the full things. So um, for imperialism, preeminent scholar Edward Say describes the primary meaning of imperialism as thinking about settling on controlling land that you do not possess, that is distant, that is lived on and owned by others. For all kinds of reasons, it attracts some people, but becomes misery for others. And so um, Linda Tuivwai Smith, outlines imperialism comes in a sequence of events. So discovery, conquest, exploitation, distribution, and appropriation. So discovery comes first, and then conquest, exploitation, etc. cetera. Um, so 
um, for me, that's just pretty much a good definition of that. Um, so for colonialism, um, uh, Linda says that colonialism is but one expression of imperialism. And so um, Native American scholars, Tuck and Yang, suggest two forms of settler colonialism known as external colonialism and internal colonialism. So there's many different forms of colonialism, um, like economic and um, or, or neo-colonialism, but um, for the ones for like New Zealand, Australia, it's settler colonialism. So we're just going to be talking about settler colonialism. And so um, external colonialism involves taking materials, plants, water, animals, and humans for the purpose of material gain, technological advancement, and economic growth. This in turn benefits the harboring of settler colonialism. It also prepares and develops military colonialism in order to con conquer and claim more. Internal colonialism is where the structures of imperial white domination control, isolate, manage, and transfer human beings into prisons and ghettos and minor minoritizing, schooling, and policing them. So in Victoria, in, in Victorian context in Australia, this was agriculture, so farming, mining, gold, gold mining, so 2% of the world's gold actually came from, that went to the crown actually came from Victoria. Settlement, Aboriginal protectorates, reserves, missions and government policies. So they're all what's in this criteria of what Tuck and Yang are saying. So um, according to um, uh, Tehivwai Smith, research is one of the dirtiest words in Indigenous world's vocabulary. It stirs up silence. It conjures up bad memories and it raises a smile that is knowing and distrustful. And this is from research in past and recent centuries. So basically it's about how it was conducted and the types of authority that it has, such as the researcher and all the institution. So we'll look into that. Um, so the massive um, contribution to Western science knowledge and its legitimacy has been through colonial expansion. Knowledge of biology, botany, linguistics, geography were originally collected from new information about land, animal, insect, and plant species. And so the early stages of this type of research was through amateur collectors and explorers who collected information on Indigenous people's culture, language, and way of being. And so um, Linda points out that these early collectors alongside researchers today collected indigenous knowledge that was random, ad hoc and damaging. And so one of the damaging things was the ideologies and discourses used at that time when this information was delivered across the colonies. So this informa information went everywhere. It went into people's homes, it went into pamphlets, it went um, into um, universities, um, it went everywhere into books. And so this was mainly based around the thought that Indigenous culture, language and people and way of being were savage and primitive, but also for the fact that people believed that Aboriginal languages were inferior and dumb. They would dehumanise Indigenous people, especially Indigenous women, through their descriptions drawn from discourses of zoology. Another issue with these early collectors is based on gender. They would project their views of European women onto Indigenous women. Indigenous women were excluded from certain forms of communication, such as treaties and trade, therefore perceiving Indigenous women in this train of thought. It is through these assumptions that affected the types of information collected. And so um, some of the examples she gives is, um, you know, uh, in newspapers, uh, you know, the, the words such as native man, but um, Indigenous women are described as a female native, as if they were a subhuman of animal life. Um, and so Indigenous women, um, young Maori women have been um, compared to as an unbroke fillies, so horses. And so these are the sorts of things that these early people would write about Indigenous people. In, um, this is the sort of discourses. And so um, in Australia, these are the sorts of things that um, the ideologies and that were perceived about Indigenous people in Australia. Um, and so a lot of things happened, like um, Indigenous people were forcibly taken and put in um, carnivals and zoos. And so the, these are the sorts of information that the colonies thought. And so this created a sense of fear and um, ideas about, and continuing ideas about how Indigenous people were. 
Um, here's an example of um, Indigenous people being put on display with zoo animals. Um, this is in relation to the Fijian people. And so I've, um, another thing that I want to talk about in detail that, um, that it wasn't well, from the chapter, but these are the sorts of things that was happening. So Henry Reynolds actually talks about this, which is the great chain of being, which was um, developing ideology of the 18th and 19th century. So this placed all living things in a hierarchy where Europeans were on top, so they were closest to God, and animals and plants were on the bottom. Indigenous and people of color were placed below Europeans. These ideas were taken to the Australian colonies where Aboriginal people were viewed to be on the bottom of the human list in continuum with apes and monkeys. This developed it in Europe and American science of the 18th and 19th century. So this is part of science, basically, um, Darwinism, et cetera. Um, examples. So this is an example from um, the um, Aboriginal Protection um, Board. It was a, it's a report um, from the select, select Committee of Aborigines. And um, this is from um, a man called Tyres. He's a commissioner of Crown Lands. So this is based on his observation. He was asked the question, this is the answer he gave. The children are not dressed nor cradled. They are carried about on the backs of the mother in a net made fast around her neck. No attempt is made to modify their form. They are left as much to nature as a litter of pigs. Here's an example from a protector um, recording um, his observation of judge or wrong kingship. Um, the family and social relationship of these people was one of the darkest features of their history. No marriage bond or law of any kind existed among them. And in the matter of choice or selection, the woman had no voice for she was virtually the property of her nearest male relative and in the matrimonial sense could be disposed by him at any time. A stupid custom among them, which they called Ngalan, whenever a female child was promised in marriage to any man, from that very hour, neither he nor the child's mother were permitted to look upon or hear each other speak, nor hear their names. Basically, he's not understanding the kingship structures and he's um, pretty much making a claim here that there was no kingship structure. Um, as much as, and so these are the sorts of things that affected the way that they recorded things. So for Parker, we have to, for Jaja Wrong, um, traditional kingship structures have to be reconstructed based on neighboring languages because collectors such as this, um, these are the attitudes that have, determines the types of things that was recorded. Um, and so here's another example from anthropology and Linda in the book does point out that even though anthropology has been, the, for most Indigenous people, has been what's been the most baddest part of research because a lot of this is, um, a lot of what they've done in, in the past and stuff has been quite bad. But, um, but um, she says she doesn't want to single out anthropology, but I do want to put in this here. Um, so basically, clan after clan has died out and the few wretched survivors are obliged to take such mates as death has left them. The old people may remember the old rules, but the young folks grew up in ignorance of them. So basically what they're saying is that um, they only want to talk. To, so there was this growing idea in early anthropology that you only talk to the full bloods, don't talk to the, um, the young folks or the ones who are mixed with European because they don't know nothing. Um, but in some of the research I've been finding um, is that Howard himself actually um, talked to a lot of um, elders um, at Corinduck Mission, but he didn't talk to the younger generation or, or the generation who was mixed. And so listening to my great, great auntie um, who was born in 1899 talk about her parents speaking language and, um, and, and the next generation of Auntie Ivy's people who linguist Louise Herkus interviewed, um, I found that this older generation did speak a language, but it was, a, um, it was like, a mixed language of all these different languages put together based on because everyone's taken on the missions and stuff like that. And so this sort of frames the types of stuff that um, early anthropologists did. So we don't have this information because they didn't want to talk to these young people. And therefore, this is why some information is lost. Um, and because there's this idea that, um, you know, the full bloods, the older generate full bloods were, um, were more authentic type thing. And so, yeah, I'll go to the next thing. Um, and so these early collectors in Victoria were botanists, protectors, missionaries, surveyors, 
early anthropologists, magistrates, members of the Aboriginal Protection Board. And so this is what's in Victoria. And so they all have in common theme in the early development of Western science and knowledge, but also their roles within the grand scheme of colonialism and imperial expansion. So when they were recording, they had an agenda and this agenda was mainly about, was mainly focused around the colonial sort of project, what's going on. So for instance, the protector's main duties were, these were the duties. And so their main duties were, if you go to three and four, you can see that they were to Christianize Aboriginal people, to convince them to relocate to one area. So this was the early stage of missionaries and government policies, um, which would be an actual, um, would be actual legislation. This is just the early stage because Aboriginal people were um, persuaded to these places with food and medical care. Um, and so here's another one to learn the language for the purpose of communication. So what these protectors would do were, was would write religious psalms in languages. So basically they recorded the language because they were using it to Christianize and to communicate for, the, for all these other reasons. Um, and so these people had no formal linguistic training, these early collectors, and they had no awareness of Aboriginal languages. Some based their knowledge of language around the structure of Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, but Aboriginal languages are not Indo-European languages. And so collecting, gathering and recording of language was generally through a set of short answer and questions. For example, what is the word for kangaroo? What is the word for brother? And so Austin and Crowley sort of give us an example of the types of things because in the early days, um, Aboriginal people didn't speak much English. And so there was a lot of pointing and gesturing going on. And so, for example, the word lease will give the word for spider, but the actual meaning was to bite. And then the word for dig, because um, there'll be the word for dig, but actually meant the word for drink because you'd be digging in the ground for water. Um, and so the collectors points to the insect and says spider and the Aboriginal person says, um, look, it will bite you. I think I said that before. Yeah, this is what I was saying before, basically. Um, and so um, Tifai Smith talks about uh, the authority of um, these researchers. And so she doesn't make a distinction between scientific research and forms of amateur collecting journalistic approaches, filmmaking, or other ways of taking Indigenous knowledge. Um, and so reasons being is that institutions such as universities were established in the colonies to house Indigenous information that was collected during the colonial expansion. Said states that Western academic scholarship had centered itself around this imaginative idea of the Orient. So in his context, the Orient is the Middle East because the West had made up these ideas about Middle East especially in the academic scholarship in, um, in the universities and how they taught it. And so this created a sense of ownership for corporate institutions to make statements about the Orient, authorizing views of it, describing it by teaching about it, settling it, ruling over it. And at the same time, the indigenous people whose culture it belongs to are excluded, um, excluded out of all this. Um, and this exclusion is quite real. Government policies controlled every movement of Aboriginal people. Great Australian science um, involves where Aboriginal culture, history and matters were being forgotten and ignored in the greater half of the 20th century after the period when government policies relocated and controlled Aboriginal people. And this was an immediate way for the next generation of white Australians to forget about what had happened. And this also determined what was taught in schools. Example, um, the, the heroic stories of Captain Cook Sorry, my charger. <laughs> oh, saved by the bell. Um, and so the people who made Australia great is a good example of, um, there's only a few examples of Indigenous people being mentioned, and there's only a few examples of actual, and women being mentioned. And mostly the people who made Australia great are older white men. And so um, here's another example of, um, uh, uh, historians and academics sort of um, having an authority over Indigenous knowledge. So fragmentary but significant evidence gathered from Thelma Carter, who spent her childhood at Lake Tyres in Gippsland, and Mrs Ivy Sampson from Corandirk and Barmer regions, Sursa, early 20th century, reveals that Bowman may not have received his information from female informants, as both recalled having seen the women digging for yams 
describing them as little long thin leaf plants. Caution is needed here because God, which is um, uh, she's um, a botanist, has correctly warned by 1860, Murnong was so scarce around Melbourne that younger Aboriginal people had become uncertain about the identification of Murnong. So what he's, Kay is doing here is making a claim that we've got to be cautioned about what um, Aboriginal people say, because apparently God says that there weren't any um, Murnong around Melbourne. And so um, Auntie Ivy Sampson needs an is my great, great auntie. And so um, this information that they give, um, I would consider this valid because her knowledge of families at Quarrendick and live experience has been a massive contribution to the work of um, anthropologist Diane Barwick. She was interviewed by curator and anthropologist Alan West in 1968. In 1978, Ani Ivy was interviewed by historian Testi Arugu, and some of those interviews are quite um, detailed information. It's very, very good information about people of her generation and what they experienced because we don't get much of these people from her generation because she's just one generation down from colonization. So her parents were born into the early stages of um, 1850. So this information is really, really valid because, yeah, it, she was interviewed by your, your anthropologist, Uncle Wayne Atkinson. Um, and then she was interviewed by linguist Louise Herkes. Um, and also in the um, interviews of Arnie Ivy, she does talk about, um, you know, her seeing elders make canoes, seeing them make farm fire from these, from these sticks. So she actually gives details of seeing elders at Corondoak Mission that doing these practices and her father doing her, these practices and her mother speaking language, she's actually got living memory of this. And, and so, you know, it's sort of um, privileging expert over persons who actually experience this is, is quite annoying. Um, and so the authority is like, we have a history. So this is sort of from a quote from um, further on in her book. It's not from the first chapter, but I've kind of brought this in because I kind of want to give more of a detailed context. So here's a quote from Mita, which is, uh, we have a history of people putting Mary under a microscope in the same way a scientist looks at an insect. The ones, that's doing the, the ones that are doing the looking are giving themselves the power to define. And this power to define is tradition that date back at, um, as far as early collectors. So once they define, these definitions can be considered legitimate. And this can be dangerous for those cultures who has been lost, stolen, discriminated. And so the example with Kaye back here is pretty much what's going on here. He's basically defined something um, as well. This is sort of an expansion of what this means. Um, and so Western science and research has had a long history of making decisions and speaking for predominantly misrepresenting Indigenous cultures and knowledges and people. Western research has made assumptions that it knows everything about Indigenous culture, people, way of being, even though it was collected in a short period of time. And so Western science is ideologies and the way it is taught may assume that it can improve the conditions of an oppressed community. And so those conducting research and working with communities are often believed that they are the individuals who embody this ideal and are the natural representations of it. But um, Lind also points out that there has been, a, um, there has been many researchers who have had a good relationship with the communities that they worked with and are highly respected. For instance, in Victoria, um, li um, linguist Louise Herkes is an example of someone who has had a good relationship with Aboriginal communities whose languages she documented and researched. Um, so the types of colonialism, imperialism, founding research is the rules that are constructed with it. These former rules are drawn from scholarly disciplines and scientific paradigms that are supported and housed by institutions such as universities and the state. Through this Eurocentric approach of classification, representation, evaluation, this is how the West constructs rules that govern what knowledge is considered legitimate. So what is impossible and what is impossible. And I've sort of skipped ahead on page 43 there because she actually talks about it with detail and I really want to expand on what these formal rules are all about because colonialism is all about rules. Um, and so, 
Um, I saw them expanded on the types of things that linguistics does in terms of rules. So linguistic observation identifies rules that relate to the function of languages. So here's the rules that is beginning to happen. These rules are described in the meta language or formulae that are often codified in descriptive grammars whose genesis and observations are chiefly based on standardized European languages. Because linguistics and its development was Eurocentric um, based on Indo-European languages, the descriptions of how languages are functioned, et cetera, this is the, this is the meta language and the formula of linguistics. And um, generally this meta language and formula is in Latin. And so Latin was the language of the intelligent people in the 18th and 19th century. And so, um, and Latin was used to, as part of the descriptions of what they use about indigenous people. Um, so in linguistics, we have these um, prescriptivism and descriptivism. So I just don't wanna to be too technical here is that descriptivism is what linguists do. And what linguists do is that we just describe, like what linguists do is they describe the natural state of people speaking whether it is standard or non-standard. So they would say like, there's a standard, I got you, and then I gotcha, which is non-standard. So they would um, basically describe what is going on there. So I is a pronoun, they use the word pronoun, got is a verb, and you is another pronoun. Um, and so prescript, dis, uh, yeah, prescriptivism is often referred to as language purism or verbal hygiene where language is corrected and not considered real or proper. This is also sort of similar to the grammaticans in, in schools where they say, you can't say this, you can't say that, you, gotta, you can't use, um, you know, you can't use but at the end of the sentence. And sometimes verbal hygiene can be an extreme. So verbal hygiene is extre it's the extremities of it, where comments such as, the way you pronounce your vowels, people would say, oh, that's not how you pronounce that word with the vowels. It can be as detailed as that. Or people, you know, correcting you and, and, and reading, you know, grammar dictionaries and stuff like that, that sort of stuff. So in language, in language reawakening, language, the authenticity and being correct in how one uses a heritage language can bring anxieties to the people working in um, their communities. And this is generally over the shame of anger of not speaking and knowing one's language. From my experience working with Aboriginal communities in Victoria, these anxieties alongside the shame and anger, anger are quite common. It's very, very common because um, in Australia, like especially where Aboriginal people don't speak their languages, it's basically, um, it's such a, such a, hard, such a hard road to, to do. Language revitalization is about reclaiming one's identity and sovereignty and healing oneself from the traumatic impacts of colonization. And so um, the wanting to speak the language like the ancestors is part of this, is part of all this. Um, and so li a linguist may observe the historical record. So in language reawakening, when they reconstruct a language, they would compare all the different historical spellings. So um, on, so basically a linguist will observe the historical records and identify a nge sound. And so up the top here to the far right, we have the word for husband, and then we have the word for his or her husband. Now this has been recorded by a linguist in the 1960s, and they've used this spelling um, in one language, but when in, Jajarong, we have no historical recordings. So we have to look at the history. We only can rely on historical spellings and they're in the right on the bottom. And so what linguists would do is they would look at the oral word first that was recorded by a neighboring language of Jajarong. And then they'll look at the different historical spellings down below. And they go, ah, it's Amnganit. That's what that word is. And then it has the word ending, uk. So they would share this with the community after the community has asked for advice um, relating to the historical records about 
how do you say this word? Because there's so many different spellings. How do I say this word? I'm having issues. Um, but tensions can arise if these facts move from being contextual observations. And so if the linguist goes, this is how we think the word would have been pronounced when it was first written down, to enforceable expectations policed by outsiders. So this is um, what linguists shouldn't do, is to speak this language properly means by using the initial ng sound ne. Um, there can be no more profound a subversion of a decolonizing agenda of language revitalization than the efforts of linguists from outside the community to impose their vision on people hoping to reclaim lost knowledge and reassert broken authority over their own cultural rights. So this is the sorts of things that that sorts of things that Linda was talking about in her book that I sort of identified through reading a lot and research, but also realizing that. Um, linguist, linguist, linguistics does have these colonial rules and um, there should be a way. And yeah, it, it just does, it's there, it does happen. Um, and so colonialism and its impacts has had a major effect on indigenous people from across the world, whether they're first world or developing countries. Um, indigenous people are still impacted by, the, by effects of colonialism in any shape or form. The system in itself is built to oppress Indigenous communities and Indigenous communities will, if you go to a lot of talks or um, um, they, these are the sorts of things that are discussed. Um, there is a disadvantage, whether it be living conditions, health, well-being, and education. Children are forcibly removed from their homes. Indigenous people are constantly fed messages about their worthlessness, laziness, dependence, and lack of higher order human qualities. And so this is sorts of things that sort of um, are not properly acknowledged in across that Linda points out that aren't properly acknowledged in um, like institutions, universities um, and general society. But also these are the sorts of things why Indigenous people don't trust the system um, as well. So we've got to start thinking about why is there distrust? So I got permission for this. So for my uh, on this thesis, I um, interviewed the judge wrong community. And so what in this yarning, um, it's a yarning approach um, by Batiste. And so what is um, this yarning approach is about is that we're talking about here is the fact that um, because of the effects of colonization and how the system is so non-trusting that community ended up not trusting their own Aboriginal organisation. So this is basically what we're talking about here. And so um, I'll give you about two, three minutes, two minutes to just quickly um, read, um, read it if you want. But I've left the conversation in its natural form, um, in its natural um, yarning sorts of things. And so the person I'm talking to is Raquel Kerr. She's a judge on the rapper Yorda Yorda and Bunurong woman. And so um, this is sorts of things that um, that I'm talking with Mob about um, Aboriginal organisations, researchers, um, and why there is so mistrust um, going on in the community um, and, and sorts of stuff like that. So I'll just give you a few times to just read. Just sort of let me know if you finished, like I'll give you two minutes, like till 2.42. Or not even two forty two, like two forty one. And so these are the sorts of things that's really important, even with research as well, is that um, these are the sorts of you know, thoughts and feelings as well. Um, 
because of the history, there is much distrust towards researchers or outsiders. And um, so um, Toifai Smith points out that culture protocols were broken, values negated, small tests failed and key people ignored. And there are many things that are needed to take into consideration when working with Indigenous communities. Indigenous methodologies are centered around cultural protocols and values. And so um, these are the sorts of questions that Indigenous communities and activists ask about outsider researchers. So for example, whose research is it? Who owns it? Whose interest does it serve? Who will benefit from it? Who has designed its questions and framed its scope? Who will carry it out? Who will write it up? And um, how will the results be disseminated? And also some other forms of judgment, um, such as, is her spirit clear? Does he have a good heart? What other baggage are they carrying? Are they useful to us? Can they fix up our generator? Can they actually do anything? And so in my um, yarning talks as well, there's sort of, um, sort of this common theme of um, what is expected from outsider research is that they have to have self-determination for the people that they're working with in mind. Um, and so that's the sorts of things that um, I'm sort of talking about with judge or wrong community as well. Um, and so research has demonstrated to show no benefit to Indigenous communities. And the only benefit the research has ha had was for the researcher who conducted it. It told things already known and suggested things that would not work. And so um, Tifai Smith talks about different expectations of the researchers. So reporting back and sharing knowledge um, is an expectation. And so um, she uses this term demystify, which is the methodologies, the theories and the analysis that are part of the research needs to be shared with the community. It must not be made brief or provided in a pamphlet form. Cannot assume that the community will not find it interesting and cannot understand, but you really need to demystify it. Um, the challenge always is to demystify, to decolonize. And this is a challenge, especially with the work that I've been doing is the fact that with the race, the, everything that I do with, with language reconstruction or anything is I always report back and always share the knowledge. Some of the thing, challenges is with demystifying is that it can be overwhelming for the community because there's a lot, there's a lot you got to do to demystify because you got to break it all down and explain where is it coming from, who's saying it, which, where's their background, where are they from, what's their intentions. Um, and so um, it's always is a challenge. And um, the community, a lot of feedback from um, Judge Wrong community has been the research is great, but it's just overwhelming and they prefer. And so there, and when you get this sort of feedback, that's where you have to work around ways of, um, you know, you can't just report once or twice. You actually got to be um, talking with the community about the same thing for a very long time until everyone gets what's going on. Because in order, if they don't get it, they're not going to make a decision. They're not going to, um, you know, accept or reject, you know, because you've got to make informed decisions. You know, you've got to inform them on the information, what's going on. It's really, really important. Um, Indigenous researchers have a different role. The engagement values, protocols, and authority systems are already known. So it's already known. So, um, so, so Indigenous researchers already know what to do. For Indigenous researchers working within the community, sharing of knowledge is an expectation. And the relationship is more personal. So it goes beyond the research work. It, it goes beyond, it goes in the home. Um, there are many issues and barriers that can um, impact the Indigenous researcher, um, which is very, very different to um, um, non-Indigenous researchers. There, are, there could be personal issues in the community. There's the, um, the insider-outsider, which was actually spoken by Leslie and um, Jakey in the first talk. But um, what Linda talks about is that Indigenous researchers are often felt like outsiders in the community because of the attainment of a Western qualification. And from my experience, this has happened to me many times um, where um, because I've been to university, that has been sort of a discredit to what I, I have to say. Um, at the end of the day, um, it's just a white man's stuff. Whereas in academia, they can be viewed as a political opposition. So um, they are like the indigenous researchers are against us. 
Um, insider judgments include family background, status, politics, age, gender, religion, as well as on their own perceived technical ability. So these are the sorts of things that can happen um, depending like different politics, um, your, your age and gender can be an issue as well. Um, because if you're a young person, you're a researcher in the community and you've got knowledge that is can be an issue. Um, but also gender can be an issue um, because if say uh, a young young person who's a male is um, into stuff, doing stuff research and an and elder says that's women's business, you gotta stay out of that. You know, um, that's, not your, that's not your place to be looking at or reading and you can't make decisions on that. Only we can make, you know, there's the sorts of things that can happen too. Um, and so um, there's also this common theme that happens, which is that indigenous researchers are often replaced by non-indigenous researchers with their own communities. And um, this can be um, very, very, um, basically, yeah, it does happen. And that, this is the sort of things that Linda was talking about that does happen um, in, in the chapter, but she talks about it a bit more in detail.